Praise God. Here this morning, turning to Romans chapter 6, and I just want to change and do an individual message here on water baptism as we prepare to do our water baptism service here this afternoon. I want to preach a specific message from Romans chapter 6 on this, and this is my title here this morning, The Spiritual Meaning of Water Baptism. The spiritual meaning of water baptism. Reading from Romans chapter 6 and verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not. What a question. Know ye not that so many of us as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him in baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we are dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as unto, as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the word of God this morning and the simplicity of this gospel, the power of this gospel and the truth of what has happened to us in Christ when we were born again. Lord God, saved by the grace of God. Lord God, I thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ that in him we have been crucified. We have been buried and we are risen again. We are new creatures in the Lord Jesus Christ. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And to Christ be all the glory and all the praise. No resolution could have done this. No religion could have done this. No tradition could have done this. But the living person of Christ did do what no man could do. We love you this morning, Lord Jesus. Amen. My message is the spiritual meaning of water baptism. You see, the Bible does have various symbols. Here this morning we broke bread. We had the Lord's table. We had the juice and the bread representing. They're symbolic. They're symbolic. They symbolize something. And do you know what? They symbolize a powerful truth in the Bible. That Christ died for us on the cross. That his body bear our sin. Also under this uh, pulpit here, I've got a little bottle of oil. The Bible says, if you're sick, call for the elders and they'll anoint you with oil and pray for you. Now that oil isn't anything special. I think we had one from Jerusalem or Israel or somewhere. It's not special. I can assure you, it represents, it's symbolic. So that oil symbolizes the power of the Holy Spirit. So when we pray, when we anoint them with oil, it's not the oil that does 
us anything. This, this little bit of juice that we take this morning cannot wash away your sins or forgive your sins. It is symbolic. And yet there's a powerful dynamic truth. If you partake of this table wrongly, you could get sick, you could die. That's what the Bible teaches. That's why it's so serious. When you anoint someone with oil, they could instantly get healed. And we know as well, we practice head covering here in this church. It's symbolic. There's an entire biblical teaching. It's only a symbol. It is nothing in itself. It's not it. It is representative. But also we know that water baptism, the act of being baptized in water, is symbolic. We know that in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 19, and various other verses, that when someone got saved, born again, they knew it. They knew that they'd been saved. They knew they were born again. As soon as you get saved, you get baptized in water. That's what happens. But that baptism in water, it is a symbol. It doesn't have the power to change you. Water cannot wash away your sin. Water cannot change the nature of a man. I watch lots of people be baptized in water. It never changed them. They're as big a rogue afterwards as they were before. It is symbolic and yet it has a powerful dynamic truth that when you understand it and you believe it, there is power there. Now when we come to the book of uh, Romans, we actually see Now from chapter 3 to chapter 5, we are dealing with justification by faith through the blood of Jesus or through the finished work of the cross. What Jesus done on the cross, he died for me. He justified me. I receive it by faith. I am forgiven by faith. And so chapter 3, 4 and 5, it is dealing with this experience. I'm washed in the blood. I am saved by grace. But when we come to chapter 6 that we read here this morning, we are moving from salvation by faith through grace in Christ. We are not moving in chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 8 to discipleship and this area of sin in the Christian's life. You see, water baptism, today I'll take about three minutes or less for someone to be baptized in water. It takes no time at all. But what I'm about to preach to you takes a lifetime of working it out. Yes, it's true of the person who's born again. I have been crucified, buried, and resurrected in Christ. But also, I'm going to live this out over an entire lifetime. And so we symbolize it in baptism and water. But there is an entire lifetime of truth. It began a conversion, but it continues until we meet and face the Lord Jesus Christ again. And so when we come to Romans chapter 6, it's not dealing with water baptism. Some people make this mistake. Colossians 2 or Romans 6, it's not talking about water baptism. It is talking about the true spiritual meaning that's symbolized by water baptism. Water baptism does not crucify the flesh. It does not deal with sin. It doesn't. It cannot do. We know that. But you know what? The truth of what water baptism symbolizes is contained in Romans chapter 6. In verse 1, this word baptism is, is used. As we begin to go into this chapter, we begin to see in verse 3, baptized into his death. We see this word baptism is used in this chapter in a very real way. It is the Greek word baptizo. It is a Greek word, and I want to explain it to you here this morning. Baptizo is used 77 times in our New Testament. 13 of those times are used concerning John the Baptist's baptism in water of repentance. Six of the times that this is used, it's spoken of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on individuals or groups of believers. And so we begin to understand this, John's water baptism. Then we see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It is called a baptism as well. But I want you to see what does the word baptizo actually mean? Now, there's different Greek words that mean different things. That's obvious. And so if we talk about sprinkling water on someone, 
That is the word rantizo. It's a different Greek word. You never speak about baptizoing in relation to sprinkling. It's utterly impossible. Neither is it the word echio. That means you pour water. It's not that word. It definitely isn't. Then there's luthe. It is to wash the body. Now, I'm not a Greek speaker, okay? So forgive me for my Greek. I, I barely can keep up with English here this morning. But you know what? Baptizo doesn't mean to sprinkle. It doesn't mean to pour. It doesn't mean to wash your body with water. What does baptizo mean? This Greek word actually is totally different from all of them. Let me explain it to you. One of the meanings for baptizo means to dip repeatedly, to immerse completely, to submerge under liquid or water. It is that no part of the body is above that water. That's what baptizo means. You are plunged in beneath the water. It also means to moisten or soak. If you're not soaked, you haven't been baptized. To sprinkle on your head. You're not baptized, you haven't been baptized. But do you know what? To be saturated or soaked. This word was used in the first century concerning dyeing garments. You would take a garment and you would submerge it in the water. So when it's left in the water, what is in the water goes into it. This is how they used to dye garments. So you would have purple dye in the liquid. You've got a nice white garment. What do you do? You actually moisten it. Or you want the purple in the white garment. What do you do? You submerge it. That's what it is to get what is in the water you want to get in the garment. And there's a symbolic truth here. What the truth is when you're baptized in Christ, you want some of that to get into you. You want to be saturated, soaked, dyed by the reality of the Lord Jesus Christ. It also means to cover totally with fluid, to plunge beneath. And it was used of a drowning man. If a man's drowning, you go, going, he's baptizo, he's finito. I'm telling you, we're not going to see him again. Someone better pull them out of there. And so we see that baptizo is the strongest word possible to explain your and I identification with the Lord Jesus Christ. When we're born again and when we get baptized in water, we are identifying. You're being baptized into the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a spiritual experience. And so notice with me in Romans chapter 6 here, there's three truths I want to give you this morning that are mentioned here. Number one, baptized, verse three, baptized into his death. Number two in verse four, baptized into his burial. Number three, we find it in verse four and five, baptized into his resurrection. These three, three things, bury, sorry, crucifixion, burial and resurrection is what? It is the spiritual meaning of water baptism. When we see water baptism today, it represents three things that are happening. Now notice these three things of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. There are three historical facts. They happened at a point in time, in a place. They are literal three historic facts. They are factually true. They actually happened. Christ was crucified outside of Jerusalem. He did get buried for three days and his body lay in the grave. On the third day, he was raised from the dead triumphant and ascended on high to the right hand of the Father. These are historic facts. Also, there are three simple facts of the basic gospel. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says in verse 1, concerning the gospel which I preach. What was the gospel? What is the definition of the gospel? What did Paul preach? Well, in verse 3, he says, for I delivered unto you first all that which also I received. So Christ gave it to him Paul wrote it and gave it to us. What are the facts of the gospel that he preached? How that Christ died. That's the first fact. For our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And so we see this is not his only historic fact. It is also the gospel message. These three points of reality. But do you know what? When we come to Romans 
chapter 6, and we see that we have been justified by faith. I have been forgiven. I have been washed from my sins. I am saved. I am born again. I'm a new creature. It's by faith I've been saved. Do you know you go straight into discipleship? This is now the message of discipleship for those that have come to faith in Jesus Christ. What is the true spiritual meaning of water baptism? Anybody can get baptized in water. Most of them don't understand it. They've got no concept. It, it means nothing to say, well, you just do that. Very few, I mean even mature Christians, have little understanding about the true meaning. That's a symbol. That is the outward act we do. But it's got an entire truth, an entire lifestyle that comes out of that. Let me show you here this morning the first one, the first spiritual meaning of water baptism is the death of Jesus Christ and our crucifixion with him. Look at verse 3. It says, Know ye not, and underline that word, no, know ye not. What a question. Do you not even know this? Don't you understand this? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Or look again at verse 6. He says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin may be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Notice in verse 3 and verse 6, he uses this word to know. Don't you know that you're crucified with Christ? What does water baptism symbolize? You've been crucified with Christ. Not only did Jesus die on a cross, I was crucified with him. And so when you respond, say, I want to be baptized. I've been born again. You know what you're saying? I know. I know that I have been baptized. I'm getting baptized into the death of Jesus. To know it means be conscious, to become very aware, to perceive or to resolve. I don't care how long ago it is that you got baptized in water. Can I say, don't you know that you were baptized into the death of Christ? Don't you know that you died with him? Don't you know this? I'm not saying, do you feel it? You see, some Christians say, I don't feel dead. I don't feel crucified. I don't feel that's a reality. I don't feel that I died to sin. Who said this had anything to do with feelings? You see, too many Christians, they're ruled by what they see and feel and think, by their personal experience. Oh, but I, I sinned against God. Oh, I can't get victory over this thing. I don't know how to go forward. You know what? You're ruled by something you should never be ruled by. He says, do you not know? To know is with the mind. It's to know facts, to know details, to know truth, to know what the Bible says. You say, but sure, it's not a reality in my life. I, I, I don't know this thing. But a real Christian has to come to know that they know they've been crucified. This isn't something you feel or you merely imagine, or you confess in the being. You've got to know it. What does the Bible teach? Are you born again? What does the Bible teach? You've been crucified with Christ. Oh, but I can't feel it. Who said it had anything to do with that? It says if your faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have been. You know now that you're a Christian, you've got to come to know this. To un I, I told you, I said this is an entire life. Right at the beginning, you get baptized in water and you go, that's all there is to know about that. Really? Do you realize you're going to spend the rest of your Christian life finding out the power? I have been crucified with Christ. Just like, let me ask you, did you see Christ die? Did any of you in this room? I hope none of you respond. I hope none of you will talk later. But did any of you see Jesus die on the cross? Were any of you there? Did any of you feel it? Did any of you touch it with your hands? Do any of you have uh, 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 iPhone pictures of it or a video of it? None of you have that. None of you. How do you know Jesus died? See, you're sitting here and go, I know he died. I know he was crucified. No one could talk me out of this. Why is it different with your crucifixion? When it comes to, are you crucified? Did you die? Have you died to sin? You go, I don't know. 
I don't know. You know why? Because you're doing it somewhere else. You're, you're trying to perceive this. You need to go back to the Word of God and say, I know, I perceive, I understand, I believe the Word of God. I have been crucified with Christ. Know ye not. You see, it says here that it is your old man that has been crucified. Or he goes further here. He says, he calls it the body of sin. Now, what is the body of sin? It is the whole original principle of sin. It is sin expressed through the body. And it is also called the flesh. In Romans chapter 7, verse 5, verse 18, verse 25, and other verses, it talks about flesh. What is flesh? It is the body of sin. It is that body that sin operates through. That's why Paul, as a believer in Romans 7, he, he says, I, 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 there is sin. That flesh, that old nature, that body of sin, it does sin. It is very real. And so we know that it's not, Paul says, he says, it's not me sinning, it's my flesh. That wasn't an excuse. You know, we've got lots of Christians who too, they, they, they'll blame everybody apart from themselves. Paul wasn't doing that. You know what? He realized he's got a new creature. He's born again. He's alive in Christ. But he's saying there's a problem here that I'm trying to work through. You know what it's called? The flesh, the body of sin. Sin comes through that old nature. But notice the truth here that is represented by water baptism. When you plunge down into the water, when you're actually put down into that water, do you know what it represents? Spiritually, there's a truth. You were crucified. If you're a Christian, if you're in Christ, to be baptized into Christ, what does it mean? I'm getting baptized into Christ. What does that mean? baptized into his death, immersed, lost, saturated. That death is going to impact my entire life. There's lots of people who claim Christ. They're not dead to themselves or to sin or to this world. You know what? They're very alive. They, they don't have any desire to experience this crucified life. It says in chapter 6, verse 2, we that are, are, what word? Will be, no, are we that are are dead. It's the aorist Greek tense. It means consummated, finished, a once for all act. In other words, you're not trying to kill yourself. You're not trying to be crucified. Most Christians are saying, I hope to be crucified. I'm trying to attain on this. I'm not sure I've got the energy or the power. That old nature, boy, have you ever met him down a dark alley? Have you ever met him when you went home and you closed the door and you've just been with people and you get angry or whatever else and you meet that old fallen nature? I, I want to tell you, it's a very, very real thing. And yet here, it's not trying to crucify him. The Bible says you were crucified 2,000 years ago. I was crucified on that cross. I haven't seen it. I wasn't there. It's not a feeling. I know it to be true. It is as factual and as real as Jesus dying upon the cross. It actually says here in verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with Christ. So what does that mean? That the body of sin might be destroyed. Notice that word destroyed. That henceforth we should not serve sin. Are you serving sin? There's a way through this. You've got to realize the old nature, your flesh has been destroyed. If you begin to know this and understand it and grip it and believe it and stand on the word of God, you know what? You no longer serve sin. It's a very real thing. What does the word destroy mean? It's used 26 times in our New Testament. 25 of those times the Apostle Paul uses it. It doesn't mean eradicated. It doesn't mean to put out of existence. It doesn't mean to pull up by the roots that there's no more evidence of it. It doesn't mean that. This is what the Greek word for destroyed means. It means to render it entirely idle, to render it inactive, to make of no effect, to make inoperative. You know, a car, you can make it inoperative. Just take, know how to take a few certain things out. It's the car's still there. Oh, it's still in its place. All the parts are there. But 
If Paul being a mechanic knows that certain thing to take out, and if you remove that one little item, you know what, all day long I, I could fiddle with it and not do any harm to it, but he could go in there and take one thing out. The car becomes inoperative. It means to become without power, to put out of use, to put out of business, to fire. Any has ever been fired? Well, Brother Clinton used to say, as a preacher or pastor, if you haven't been fired two or three times in your lifetime, you're not much of a preacher at any rate. Well, thank God I haven't been fired yet, so I'm, I'm just holding on here. But this destroying the old man or the body of sin means to fire him. It means to unemploy him. In other words, he was employed. I rely on him. I expect him to operate. I am looking for him to function. I allow him. But you know what? To destroy Remember, it's this experience of being crucified with Christ. It fires him. It actually puts him in prison. He's not dead in the sense of annihilated. But it said, you've got a death penalty hanging over you. You know, one of these days, I'll never have this flesh life again. It is going to be eradicated. I'm not going to have to fight sin again. I won't be tempted again. I won't fail God again. I wish I hadn't failed him, but I have. I have failed him. But I know that the truth of this and the power of this is the secret. I want to tell you this morning, this is what water baptism symbolizes. Anyone can look at water baptism and say, I'm just getting baptized because I believe in Jesus. No, it means something. I have been. It's screaming out to us today. You've been crucified with Christ 2,000 years ago so that you will no longer be a servant of sin. It says in verse 6, to not serve sin. Verse 7, freed from sin. Verse 17, delivered from sin. It's a very real thing. In verse 5, it says that we're planted together in the likeness of his death to, to mean grown up with, closely united with. See, we want to be identified with Christ, but not his death. Real biblical Christianity is baptizo. It is immersed. It is saturated with this death of Christ. His death became my death. He died for my sins, but also I was crucified with him. This is the answer to your sin problem. Are you fighting sin? You're trying to defeat it up there, down the road. One of these days, I'm going to get the better of you. One of these days, flesh, I'm going to wrestle you to the ground. John Bunyan, writing Pilgrim's Progress, he met this old nature on the road, the Christian. He went, praise God, I'm born again. I'm walking with God. It wasn't too long until he met his old nature. He was called the old man. Do you know what he started doing? Nipping him. You ever had a donkey nip? They're horrible. They're horrible. I, I tell you, I've done it once or twice to Candace. It's horrible. She runs when she thinks I'm going to give her a donkey nip. It, it's the worst thing imaginable. Do you know what that old man was doing? to Christian and Pilgrim's Progress. He come and he nipped him and he wrestled him to the ground. Have you ever had that experience? Are you all so perfect? A real born again Christian meets that old flesh. I tell you, sir, it's a terrible thing. And yet remember, you've got to know this. You were crucified. You've been planted in the likeness of his death. It's in him. You're in his death. There's power in this death. You're not going to defeat it up the road. You need to look back to Calvary, to the cross, to his work, to his work in your heart. And you know what the secret is, is, is knowing it. Oh, but I don't feel it. I know. I know. Oh, oh but I got, I, I, I got defeated along the way. I know. I know. But you know what? You need to go back to Calvary and go, I know. You've got to know this. Second of all, the spiritual meaning of water baptism is burial in Christ, not only to be crucified, but to be buried. Look at verse 4. Therefore, we are buried with him. This isn't something that you do apart from him. It is in him or with him by baptism. Was he buried? His burial was a historic fact 2,000 years ago. You're not trying to bury your old man. You're not trying to get rid of it along the way. That happened 2,000 years ago. You were buried with him by baptism or by immersion into his death. So a lot of people only had a sprinkling of this baptism. 
Oh, it might affect my life. I know, I know. I only want immersed, sprinkled, maybe a little pouring of the death of Christ. No, 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 no. This is far more. What about the burial? Oh, but I want to be seen. I want to be at the forefront. I, 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 I want to live my life for Christ. I want him to use all my gifts. Maybe he'll say, I never want to use that stinking gift of yours. You keep saying, look at this. You can use this, Lord. I give this to you. So I don't want that. I want this over here. So he done with the rich young ruler. Master, what must I? I'll keep any commandment. All the commandments I keep. Wonderful. Just deal with this one issue. Oh no, not that issue. Master, why don't you tell me to do all the others? I don't want all the others. I want this one thing. It says he turned around, walked off sad. He didn't want to be buried with Christ. You know, it's okay to have theology and doctrine and statements on your lips and to go through the ritual of baptism or Lord's table. But you know what? There's a power with this. Have you been buried with Christ? It means the putting away of the old life. You've been crucified. You know, you understand you've been crucified. And so you're buried. Who do you bury? Do you bury dead pe or living people? Do you bury someone who's walking about? Have you ever tried to grab someone who's very much alive and say, I'm going to bury you. I think you're going to see them run at the speed of a thousand gazelles. You go, where did he go? He went that way. He's running. You don't bury living people. You bury dead people. I heard about a lady once whose husband died, but she refused to allow him to be buried. She wouldn't have let them. She, her mind was a bit off. She had problems. But he died and says, no, no, I know he's alive. She had him sitting in the seat. She sat down and talked to him. But she said, you're not going to bury him. I talk to him every night. I, I've, I haven't had this little trouble with him. There's 50 years. It's wonderful. You're not burying him. These are the best times I've ever had with him. He agrees with everything I say. You know that lady, she was not convinced her husband was dead, therefore she would not let him be buried. Some of you, because you're not convinced, you are not convinced that you're crucified. You are not convinced that you're dead. You've never, you've never walked through this burial. Burial is immersion, buried with Christ. If a dead body only has some soil sprinkled on it, it's not buried. If you lay a body in the graveyard, it's not buried. You've got to literally go down six feet, put the body down, cover all the soil back. It's gone. It's gone. You'll never look at that body again. It's gone. It is buried. What is the key to this? If being crucified with Christ, the secret is knowing this and looking back to the cross. What is the secret of burial? It is reckoning. In chapter 6, verse 11, it says, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead. You've got to reckon this, that you're dead. This term reckon is used 41 times in the New Testament. 19 of those times, it's in this book of Romans. It's an important word in the book of Romans. It also means counted. It's a mathematical term. Soof working in the bank now. Not, not sure if he would still be working there, if he would have been the old soof. I think the new soof can manage to hold things down the way the old soof. Do you know when soof first come in, he, he never got out of bed before two in the afternoon. That, that was the old man. I want to show you, I never tried to drag him out of that bed. I wouldn't have dared. I, 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 it, would have, it would have taken dynamite to change that guy. He is a guy, a limerick guy. He is saturated in this world. I would have been a fool to try and have changed his life. But you know what? I do know if a man gets born again, there's going to be a burial of that old life. Here drugs were sold. Here DJ, it's gone. It's gone. You heard a man who's buried the old life. Where is the drug seller? Where's the drug buyer? Where's the DJ? He's buried. You know what? Someone become convinced that old life's dead. Now it needs to be buried. How do you do that? You reckon it to be true. To put to one's account. Nor would you say, this is in my bank account. I'm buried. It's gone. I'll never see it again. Some of you leave the doors open. That door's open. That door's open. That door's open. That door. And then you, you go, I'll just pop over here. 
and then it'll just pop back in, and then you'll pop back over there. Sure, you've never closed the door. You, you've never buried, you've never reckoned it be true. Those doors are closed. I'll never go back through them again. Since I'm telling you the power, the simplicity of this gospel, it means you have to not only know that you're crucified, you've got to reckon that you're buried. You've got to count it to be true. You've got to impute it that that life is gone. It's buried. You know, when we talk about something being buried, we mean it's gone. It's never going to be uh, revisited. You've got to estimate. Again, not feel it, not understand it, but you've got to believe it and act upon it. Acting upon a fact. Remember what Candace taught the kids about facts. Two never becomes one. Three can never be one. It's utterly impossible. With mathematics, we deal with numbers, and numbers are always facts. So when we come to Romans 6, we're dealing with facts. It was a fact. If you're born again, you're baptized into the death of Christ, into the burial. You are submerged into his burial. I don't have the power to bury myself. I don't ha- I know, I know. I would hate to try and bury you, I assure you. I, 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 I don't have the power to close this old life off. I don't have a, the power to turn away from all that. I know. But the power is in Christ. Christ was buried. It's with him. You see, you need to understand your Christian mass. Biblical mass. I hated mass at school. I mean, I I utterly detested. I couldn't understand why they taught science at school. Chemistry, biology, physics. I, 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 I went, who in their right mind would ever want to study these? I couldn't understand. Mass was maybe above all of them. It was worst of all. I went, who would ever want to sit in a classroom and learn times tables? You'd have to be demented. There's something wrong. I want to go draw pictures. I want to play handball out in the uh, schoolyard. Who would want to learn mass? But I tell you what, when I come to this Bible, I learnt my mass. I am buried. I believe it to be true. It is a fact. That old life is gone. Believe that you died in Christ and were buried. Verse 3, it says, Know ye not that so many of you as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Then notice verse 4. Therefore, because of this fact, because of this, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, not reckoning future. I am trying to bury. I hope it will happen one day. One of these days, I'm going to see the back of this flesh. You're looking in the wrong direction. I was buried. My entire old life of sin was buried with Jesus Christ in the tomb. And it doesn't have power to come alive again. It is buried there. Christ put it there. It is a finished work. Do you remember Abraham in Romans chapter 4? It was an impossible act. God says you're going to have a child. Abraham, you're an old man. And see with this girl of yours that has followed you about all these years, married all these years, neither of you, both of you are dead. Neither of you can have a child. Now you're very old. What does it say in Romans 4.19? It's the same principle. And being not weak in faith, he considered not now his own body dead when he was about a hundred years old. Neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Some of you are consumed with that old nature. You're saying, but it's alive. I know it's alive. I, I, I can't do anything about that. You know what? You need to get into the realm of faith. I, I'm telling you like Abraham. He could have looked at that old girl and said, no, no chance. Not a chance in a million. God's saying, you are going to have a child from that girl. It won't be by some servant girl. You can do all you're going to do. That's not my plan. It's through her. But that would take a miracle. Yes. It would take a miracle. And you've got to be a faith. It says he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded. Since there's a lot of things, I am fully persuaded. I haven't attained on everything. I haven't uh, walked into everything, but I know it's true. I know it's true. When those doctors told my wife in June last year, you, you have 
six months unless you go through all of our treatment. But if you go through all of our treatment, you're going to be stuck in that bed, in that house, in that room. You'll never come into this church again. You'll never play in that piano, even with all the treatment. You're finished, you're a goner, there's nothing you can do. You know what? My, my, my natural mind screams out. For five days I cried. For five days I'm in utter shock. I, I can't even think. I'm numb. But you know what? I do know what the Word of God says. I do know what the Word of God says. I, I, I do have feelings. I have fears. I have thoughts. I have imaginations. I've got all of that. I'm not free of those things. But I do know who my God is. I do know that He can raise up the sick. I know that. It is such a real thing, a very real thing. You see, your besetting sins defeat you. A time comes when you, you say, maybe one day I'll get the victory. But you know what? There is a reckoning. When are you going to get to a point where you go, it's finished, it's buried. You only bury what's dead. And if you're not convinced that all life is dead, you'll leave it lying on top of the ground. Do you know what this water baptism is today? Shona, it's your, it's, your, it's your burial. Oh no, forgot to tell your dad. He's only finding out this morning. You didn't realize you're coming to a burial. This is a, uh, this is a burial. Third and lastly, resurrection. Crucified with Christ. Buried with Christ. Resurrected with Christ. This is what it means. Verse 4 that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Like as Christ was raised. Can I ask you, is it a historic fact? Are you convinced Christ raised from the dead? Is he still in that tomb? Did he remain dead? Or on the third day did he rise up? It's a miracle. It's impossible. It's resurrection. It was an act of God the Father. Did he come out of that grave? You know, if he's still dead, all of our faith is in vain. That's what Paul said. He said, if Christ didn't rise from the dead, then all of our believing, oh, it's good to have a bit of religion that makes you a nice guy and you want to help people. It makes you kind and you want to love people. It's very good. No, Paul said it's utterly in vain. If there is an eternal life, if Christ wasn't raised from the dead, if this isn't real, if there isn't a future life, this is absolute vanity what we're doing this morning. I, I would throw this book away. I'd have nothing to do with these lies. If Christ didn't rise from the dead, it's all game. I don't want a deception. I don't want lies. I don't want churchianity. I don't want religion. I want Christ. I want a living Christ, not a historic Christ. On that third day, Jesus rose from the dead dead by the glory of the Father. He didn't do it himself. He laid down his life. But it says that he was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Oh, there's some of you waiting. Sorry to be personal, you know. I get criticized for making it so you, personal, real. I get criticized times that then others, they go, that's what helps me. But I, I, I'm telling you, this is very personal. You know, Christ could not have done that. Some of you are waiting for some great power to raise you up. You don't, you're trying to raise yourself up into this life. I wish I could live this Christian life. I wish I could experience the resurrection life, a new life. What is resurrection? It's a new life, walking out a new Christian life that's radically different from the old. But most of you, you'll say, oh, but I can't feel it. I, I, I don't understand it. I've tried that. I wish I could walk this Christian life out, but I don't have the power. Who raised Jesus from the dead? It was the glory of the Father that raised him up. You see, you've got it wrong. You're trying to do it. Don't you realize it's impossible to get out of a, a burial? To get out of a grave, you cannot do it. It takes an action of God. It is supernatural. That's why when I preach to people, a heroin addict on the street, I'm not filled with unbelief. I go, God can change your life. They're doing deals around the corner. They do them out this front door all the time. That's our mission field. Friday night we're praying, Lord, turn that, that, that drug den right beside our church. Turn it into a place where Christ is going to be glorified. I believe this. I believe it. It's so real. We're talking about resurrection. 
Verse 4, we also should walk in newness of life. There's a new life, a new beginning, a new Christian way. There's sinners who say, I can't live the life of faith. I can't do it. I really love it. I believe it. I know it to be true, but I could never keep it. Do you think I keep it? Just ask the Christians. You think I've got the power to live this? To walk this out? To walk in holiness? To go through the... You honestly think I can face this? I can't face it. I'm the weakest man in the room. I'm the most hopeless case sitting here. Pamela might say, no, no, I'll, I'll argue with you for that one. Pamela, you've lost hands down. I am the most hopeless, the most worthless, the most unable. But there's a part, I know something. You see, there's a resurrection life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, if you don't go the way of the death, you don't go the way of life. Maybe this is why so many in the church never experience a new life. They resent the cross. They resent death to self. They do not want to be buried. Hi, here I am. Yeah. <laughs> Boy. But if you've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. They go together. Resurrection always follows being planted in his death. Verse 8, we live with him. Verse 11, alive with God. Verse 13, alive from the dead. It's so, so real. It says in Colossians 2 and 12, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him. Notice this. How does this happen? Talking about the spiritual meaning of baptism. Ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. How does this new life operate? By faith, but it's the operation of God. You believe it. And the power of God, the operation of God comes in, who hath raised him from the dead. Why am I living a new life? It's by the power of God. But I believe it. Yes, Lord, live your life in me. Live through me. What is the key of experience in this resurrection life? If we're to know that we're crucified, if we're to reckon that we're buried, what is the key to this resurrection life? It is yielding. That is the key, to yield. It says in verse 13, neither yield ye your members or parts of your body as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Give me two minutes and I'm closed. To yield means to stand beside. How do you experience this new life, this resurrection life? How, how do you experience it? You stand beside yourself and you yield up. It means to stand beside yourself, to exhibit or to command. You're stand by yourself and you're saying, do this. Eyes, stop looking there. Mm. Mouth, you better shut up right now. <laughs> this is what yield means. You're stand commanding. I, I, do you know, maybe you don't speak to yourself. I speak to myself. Why are thou downcast, my soul? Do you ever get discouraged and depressed? Do you ever feel like throwing in the towel? See, like David in the Psalms, I stand by myself and say, Soul, why art thou down? Don't you know the goodness of God? Don't you remember that he died for you? Don't you know you're going to have eternity with him? Soul, why art thou downcast? Well, that's what yield in the members of your body. You're standing there, a new creation in Christ. You're saying, no body. Now legs, you're not walking in there. Arms, you're not going to clench that fist. You're not going to do that. You are yielding the members of your body. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Romans chapter 12. What do you do? You stand beside and you present your body up. This is the secret to yielding. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. I don't get drunk. You say, don't you struggle with it? I did it 16 and 17. I couldn't stay away from it. Not for a night, not for a week. It near destroyed my life. I, I would have been in the grave now. It would have utterly destroyed me. I couldn't help it. I was driven. I'd come in at nights. I'd go in the toilet. I'd cry. Say, oh God, I'm so sorry. And I'd be panting for it first thing next morning. I, I made a ruin of my career. 
I should have been at the top of my career. I end up right at the bottom. The, the guys, the bosses shook their heads and said, what a fool you are. Drink done that to me. I couldn't help it. But I tell you, the power of God come. What a battle I had to yield up my body. Now, it was a fight. It was a fight against hell. But I did say, I'm a new creature. I am a new creature in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I offered up my body. That body must not rule you. That body is lazy. It's greedy. You're not going to eat anymore. But I want to. No, you're not. You're not going to. I want to sleep. No, you're going to get up and go to church. You're lustful. It's going to dominate you or you're going to take command over it. Either it gives you orders and ruins your life or you stand up and say, I'm fed up of this. I am fed up of this. Don't think any of us are different. We're not. We're absolutely not. Verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. Grace is not an excuse. Grace is the power of God to make me live out this Christian life so that you can be a servant of God and not a slave of sin. What are you going to do? Continue as a slave of sin? Are you going to serve sin to the day you die and then go to hell? Are you going to allow sin to destroy you? Are you going to say there is a salvation in Christ that gives me power and dominion? Not on my own. So I can't do this. I can't keep it. And finally, Galatians 2 and 20. I am crucified with Christ. I am crucified. I am. No, you're not. Yes, I am. No, you're not. Yes, I am. I know none of you go through that. I'm letting out my secrets here. I am crucified with Christ. I am crucified. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, in the body, I, how do you live that? By the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Since this is the true spiritual meaning of water baptism, it is just an outward observance that somebody has been truly born again. But it is the beginning of an entire life of making this a part of your Christian life. Sometimes it's not easy. The flesh is very real. Sin is a real problem. But I want to tell you there's three answers. To know, to reckon, to yield, and to believe I was crucified with them. I was buried. I was, not future, was buried. I was and am risen from the dead. Will you stand with me as we close in prayer here? Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Oh, we bless you. We praise you. We love you. Thank you for the word of God. Father, I pray for the spirit of revelation. Will you move in every single heart in this room? Will you draw us to the Lord Jesus Christ? Our salvation is in him. Our deliverance is in him. Our crucifixion is in him. Our burial is in him. And our resurrection is in him. I have nothing outside of him. This church can never save you. This preacher cannot save you you but I want to tell you there's a real Christ a real heavenly father that loves you there is a Christ who died for you and as he died his crucifixion became yours his burial became yours and his resurrection became yours is it not true that the resurrection of Christ is one of the greatest events in world history it's the most miraculous the most powerful, the most world-changing. But if you can believe it, and if you will yield to it, that resurrection is your resurrection. In his resurrection, you were raised. There's power. There is power in this. If only you know it, if only you reckon it to be true, and if only you yield your life accordingly. God bless you here this morning. Let's just sing this song.